We've had Frank in our church, Dr. Frank Turk in our church, uh, numerous occasions, so um, uh, really there don't even need to be an introduction of him, but we are glad he's here. We hosted an all-star apologetics conference in our church this last weekend. It was phenomenal, um, and so uh, Frank is a is well-known author. Um, he, he wrote a book, I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist, very well-known piece as well. Um, is stealing from God, uh, why atheists need God to make their case. And so both of those are out there, and he'll talk some about that. Um, you can also follow him on crossexamine.org um, and numerous other ways uh, to follow his ministry. Uh, Frank's one of the lead apologists in the world. Um, he's busy. He'll be in churches. He'll be at universities. Um, and he is somebody that will help us, you and I, uh, uh, these everyday folk, you and I, um, how to defend our faith. Um, and in a time like these, um, guys like Dr. Turk being able to come and express his gifts, um, it, it shouldn't be taken lightly. And so uh, do this. Help us welcome Dr. Frank Turk. Thanks. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. How many were here at some point this weekend or were somewhere else at the time? How many are here right now? That's all that matters. What I'd like to talk to about today is stealing from God. It's not about tithing, okay? The book is called Stealing from God, Why Atheists Need God to Make Their Case. And last time I was here, we talked about a problem. In fact, we talked about it all this weekend, that a good number of young people who are brought up in the Christian church when they go to college, sometimes we'll call home and say something like this, Dad, I don't believe in God anymore. In fact, 75% of young people will walk away from the church once they leave the home. Now, there's a number of reasons for this, but one of the reasons is intellectually they don't know why Christianity is true. Because we haven't really told them why it's true. Not, I don't, when I mean we, I don't mean Cottonwood Creek Baptist Church, because obviously John Mark teaches on this quite a bit, and you're going to do uh, a, a whole series beginning in September on evidence for the faith. So I'm not talking about this church, but generally, the church across America does not teach why Christianity is true. And they certainly don't interact with atheist arguments to see if they can diffuse those. So I'd like to do a little bit of that here this morning. In fact, many times, Young people, when they go to college, run into people like Richard Dawkins. Richard Dawkins is probably the most famous atheist in the world today. He wrote a book called The God Delusion. He thinks you're deluded if you believe in God. And he thinks that evolution has shown that atheism is true. And he's not shy about his beliefs with regard to evolution. He says this, it's absolutely safe to say that if you meet somebody who claims not to believe in evolution, that that person is ignorant, stupid, or insane, or wicked, but I'd rather not consider that. What's this wicked stuff? Where does that come from? I thought science was just objective. <laughs> not always. If the scientist is not objective, science isn't going to be objective. In fact, as we talked about this weekend, science doesn't say anything scientists do. All data needs to be interpreted, and quite frequently, when atheists interpret the data, they're interpreting it through their atheistic worldview. Doesn't matter how much the evidence points towards a designer, they're never going to conclude that. They're never going to interpret the evidence that way, because they've already ruled the designer out before they even started looking at the evidence. But nevertheless, Dawkins is somebody that young people can sometimes be attracted to. Down in UT Austin, there is a uh, professor by the name of Steven Weinberg. He's actually a Nobel laureate in physics, and he says science points towards atheism. In fact, he put it this way. He said, I personally feel that the teaching of modern science is corrosive of religious belief, and I'm all for that. If scientists can destroy the influence of religion on young people, then I think it may be the most important contribution that we can make. What? I thought the most important contribution we could make as professors is to teach young people the truth so they can go out there and be better citizens, better people. Not according to Weinberg, his position, his priority is to talk young people out of traditional religious viewpoints. He thinks that's his top priority. Of course, when he does that, he's not putting them in a neutral worldview. There's no such thing. He's trying to indoctrinate them into a materialistic, atheistic worldview. That's a new faith. And I think it takes a lot more faith to be an atheist than it does to be a Christian. And by the way, science properly interpreted does not point away 
from God, it points directly to a spaceless, timeless, immaterial, powerful, moral, personal, intelligent, sustaining cause that we would call God. Nevertheless, you also have atheists saying that reason points to atheism. This is David Silverman, president of the American Atheists. I had a debate with him a couple of years ago. In fact, you can see the debate on our website, crossexamine.org. Uh, and Silverman at the Reason Rally, which a bunch of atheists got together uh, in Washington, D.C. Uh, uh, in 2012, he said this. He said, God is a myth and reason is inherently atheistic. He thinks reason points to God, or points away from God, points to atheism. Is he right? It's not just reason, also morality seems to point to atheism, according to Christopher Hitchens. Christopher Hitchens tragically died a few years ago, very brilliant atheist, had a British accent, so it sounded even more brilliant. In fact, I had the opportunity to debate him a couple of times. They're on our website as well. This is our second debate. In one of the debates, he said this. He said, I consider it to be morally superior to be an atheist. I would rather live without that ghastly master uh, slave mentality of religion. He thinks it's more moral to be an atheist. In fact, he wrote a book called God is Not Great, How Religion Poisons Everything. Religion is evil, he says. Religious people do evil things. Religion poisons everything. Not only that, according to Richard Dawkins, the God of the Bible is evil. Dawkins has a flair for writing. Check out what he wrote about the God of the Old Testament. He said the God of the Old Testament is the most unpleasant character in all of fiction. Jealous and proud of it. A petty, unjust, unforgiving control freak. A vindictive, bloodthirsty, ethnic cleanser. A misogynistic, homophobic, racist, infanticidal, genocidal, philicidal, pestilential, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic, capriciously malevolent bully. And those are his good qualities. Now, if Dawkins is right about this, why would you even believe in such a God? Dawkins is not right about this. We talk about this in the chapter on evil and stealing from God. Nevertheless, a, a cursory view of the Old Testament, you might go, well, you know, he's got a few points here. What do we say about this? Has anyone in here ever been to Corinth? This is uh, 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 Corinth, Greece. You ever been there on the footsteps of Paul Cruz? It's my favorite place to go in the footsteps of Paul because when you go to Corinth, Greece, you stand right where Paul stood. There's no city built upon to on top of it. It's the ancient ruins from 2,000 years ago. Corinth, is, as you know, is a place where Paul spent a good amount of time and a place to which he also wrote a couple of letters, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians. And in 2 Corinthians... He's writing about his ministry and how we are supposed to rebut false teachers. In fact, he put it this way. He said, we destroy people's arguments in every proud thing that raises itself up against the knowledge of God. We're not just supposed to give a positive case for Christianity. We are also supposed to tear down, demolish arguments that are against it. I'm going to try and do that a little bit today if my mic holds out. <laughs> I'd like to try and do that today by pointing out, first of all, these arguments that atheists say point to atheism, are they really good arguments for atheism? No, they're not good arguments for atheism. Why? Because these arguments are stolen from God himself. Stolen from God himself. In fact, atheists are committing intellectual crimes. They are stealing from God to argue against him. And the book, Stealing from God, is oriented around this acrostic, crimes. And each one of these points stands for a thing that atheists say seems to point to atheism when in fact none of these things would exist unless God existed. Causality, reason, information, morality, evil, and science. Atheists are always saying, oh, they're the reasonable ones, we're the more moral ones, there's too much evil in the world, science points toward atheism rather than God. None of those things are true. They're not true at all. In fact, let me unpack this a little bit further. Atheists are materialists, yet all of these aspects of reality right here are immaterial and they're rooted in God's nature. Which means that whenever an atheist cites them to support atheism, they're stealing from God to argue against them. Now, I can't completely make the case here in 30 minutes that we have here this morning, uh, so you can go further in the book, but I want to point out just one of them. I want to unpack just one of them, this issue of morality. 
And I go to a lot of college campuses and I present. I don't have enough faith to be an atheist on college campuses. In fact, I've been to Dallas several times. Uh, in fact, uh, let's see, in September, I'll be at UT Dallas and SMU presenting this kind of information. And whenever you get a program called, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist, you always get atheists showing up, right? Even on a secular college campus. They want to come. They want to interact. They want to ask questions. And I can tell you that the elephant in the room when it comes to Christianity and the evidence for or against it isn't really evidence. It's not evidence. You know what the elephant in the room is? The elephant in the room is morality and accountability. How do I know that? Because a lot of times when I have interactions with atheists on college campuses and they appear to be a little bit hostile, I'll stop. And I'll say, wait, wait, do you mind, before we go on, could I just ask you a question? Yeah, sure, go ahead. Here's the question I ask all unbelievers. If Christianity were true, would you become a Christian? On several occasions, I've had atheists yell back at me, no! No? Wait, wait, you claim to be an atheist, a beacon of reason. Never mind if atheism's true, reason doesn't exist, why? Because if atheism is true, if we're just molecules in motion, if there is no immaterial world, we're just, we're just basically moist robots, then reason doesn't exist. Why? Because we're not reasoning, we're just reacting. Every thought we have is a result of a previous law of physics over which we have no control. But let's leave that aside. I ask you, if you're an atheist, would you become a Christian if Christianity were true? And you say, no, how's that reasonable? It's not. The problem isn't here, the problem's here. They don't want it to be true. And you know why they don't want it to be true? Because they, they don't want there to be a God because they want to be God. They want to do their own thing. They don't want to bow their knee to a creator. Hey, half the time I don't. Can you relate to this? You don't want there to be a God. You want to be God. In fact, this morning I was having breakfast over there at the hotel. You know what song came on? Remember that old song by Tears and Fears, Everybody Wants to Rule the World? That was the song when I was eating breakfast this morning. I'm going, yeah, that's true. Everybody wants to rule the world. We want to be God. We don't want there to be a God. Right down to this issue right here, morality. I want to go my own way. I'm not on a truth quest. I'm on a happiness quest. And I'll believe whatever's going to make me happy, whatever I think's going to make me happy. The problem is, for long-term happiness, the only way to get it is to go straight through truth. Because the truth will set you free. All right, let's get into this now. Let me start by asking this question. Are these rights, abortion, same-sex marriage, no-fault divorce, we could add other ones. But these are the big issues in our culture today, particularly the first two. Notice how they're all related to sex. In fact, that's the new religion. Sex is the new religion. You notice that? All the cultural wars, all built around sex. Are these really rights, however? The Supreme Court says so. We voted against these things, but the Supreme Court said, no, that's a right, that's a right, and we actually voted these in. By the way, you know who, who was the first governor to vote in no-fault divorce? Ronald Reagan. Did you know that? Yeah, 1969, 1970. He later regretted it, but it started in California, came all the way east, and now you can break up a marriage just because you want to for no real reason. Are these rights, however? Do rights come from governments? If so, which government? Do rights come from Supreme Courts? What are, where do rights come from? In fact, let me ask the question this way. Why is something right or wrong? Is something right or wrong because the Supreme Court said so? Is something right or wrong because you said so or because I said so? Is something right or wrong because of evolution, whatever that means? We're going to investigate this question, but I need to be extremely clear what we're talking about and what we're not talking about. We are not talking about whether or not you need to believe in God to know what right and wrong is. You don't. We're not talking about whether you can know right or wrong if you're an atheist. You can. How do atheists know right and wrong? Just like we do. It's written on our hearts. Paul said, the Gentiles who do not have the law have the law written on their hearts. We all intuitively know right and wrong. Jefferson said it was self-evident. On the big issues, we know right and wrong. Do you have to believe in God to be good? 
No, you can be good and not believe in God. The question I'm trying to answer is, what is good? Why is there such a thing as good? Who decides what good is? Where does it come from? That's the question we're going to try and, and answer. Why is something really right or really wrong? In order to do this, you know where we ought to start? Down at the ballpark. What do you say? Let's go down to the stadium and ask the question, who makes the rules of baseball? You ever ask yourself that question? Who makes the rules of baseball? Now, granted, baseball is an arbitrary game, right? We could change the rules, it'd be no big deal. In fact, sometimes they do change the rules. But it's just an illustration. Where do the rules of baseball come from? Well, I think to have rules of baseball, you got to have a map. It's another acronym, M-A-P. You've got to have a moral or fair standard that transcends player opinion. In other words, there has to be a standard out there that is above the players. Regardless of what the individual players think, this is the, this is the standard we're going to adhere to. Secondly, there has to be an authoritative person who transcends the players to communicate and enforce the rules. There's got to be a person out there that issues rules. Thirdly, there's got to be a purpose or objective to the game that transcends player opinion. Obviously, the uh, goal in baseball is to score more runs than the other team. But if one player on one of the teams thinks hitting more foul balls is the goal, he's just objectively wrong because there's a standard outside of him that has already established what the goal of the game is. If there's no goal to the game, then how can you have any rules? There's got to be a goal. Now, who could fit these requirements? No, that's not David Letterman. That is the new, relatively new, commissioner of baseball. Uh, his name is, I think, Rob Manfred. He fits this standard. He has a standard that he and his predecessors have developed. He's the authoritative person who transcends uh, the players, and he communicates the rules, and he establishes, as his predecessors have, the purpose of the game of baseball, right? You have to have a person out there to do this. The question is, who makes the rules of life now? That's the question we're after. Who makes the rules of life? Baseball is arbitrary, but life isn't. My point is, you still need a map. You still need a moral standard. You still need an authoritative person. And you still need a purpose. If there's no real purpose to life, there is no objective right or way to live it. The atheists are right about this. If there is no God, there is no objective morality. Many of them say that. They admit it. Because if there's no purpose to life, everything's meaningless. I wonder what they mean by that. Now, my point is, is that the person that can fulfill this is only God himself. His very nature is the standard. He is the authoritative person. He establishes the purpose of life. Wrong. Without this being known as God. So, let's take a look at each one of these. We'll start here at the moral standard that transcends human opinion. A number of years ago, I had the opportunity to go across Europe... <laughs> A couple of my sons and a friend of mine, we went from London, wound up in Berlin. We basically did what the Allies did. We went to Normandy and Paris and some other places. And along the way, we went to the Buchenwald concentration camp at Wiedmar, Germany. In Wiedmar, Germany. Anyone ever been to a concentration camp? It's a very sobering experience if you've never been to one. Well, in April of 1945, the Allies liberated the camp from the Nazis. They went through the front gate, which is still there. They looked off to the right and saw the crematorium about 100 yards in the distance. It's still there. When they got down to the crematorium, they looked in the courtyard attached to the crematorium, and this is what they saw. Brace yourself. Now, if there is no God, this is just a matter of opinion. This is just your opinion against, say, Hitler's opinion. If there is no standard beyond humanity, all actions or behaviors are mere human opinion. You can't say this is objectively morally wrong. Why? Because there's no map. There's no moral standard. There's no authoritative person. There's no purpose to life. Why not kill six million Jews to get what you want if there's no God? Why would that be wrong? 
In fact, let me ask you this question. How can you discover who was morally better, Mother Teresa or Hitler? Mother Teresa was the Catholic nun who served the poor her entire life practically in India. And of course, Hitler, the mass murderer of World War II. How can you discover who's morally better? Well, let me ask you the question this way. Which map of Scotland is a better map of Scotland? What would you need to see in order to know which map was better? Yeah, you would need to see a real unchanging place called Scotland. If Scotland doesn't exist, then these two maps are meaningless. But since Scotland does exist, we can see that map A, while it's not perfect, is a better representation of the real Scotland than is map B. Why? Because we have an external standard, a reference point by which we can measure these two maps. That's exactly what we do when we compare Mother Teresa and Hitler. Mother Teresa wasn't the standard. Hitler wasn't the standard. There's a standard beyond both of them by which we measure both of them. And we say God's nature is the standard. God doesn't look up to a standard beyond him and decide. God doesn't arbitrarily make things up. God himself is the standard. His nature is the standard of goodness. Anything that deviates from his nature is evil. The buck has to stop somewhere and it stops with God's nature. In fact, C.S. Lewis, who for many years was an atheist early in his life, once uh, he realized that the fact that there was injustice in the world, so there must be justice, in other words, there must be a standard of good, he ultimately became a Christian. And in the book, Mere Christianity, he pointed this out. He said, the moment you say that one set of moral ideas can be better than another, you are in fact measuring them both by a standard, saying that one of them conforms to that standard more nearly than the other, but the standard that measures two things is something different from either. In fact, he went on in this quote to say, if we're going to say, the Allies are going to say, because he wrote this during World War II, if we're going to say our civilization is better than the Nazi civilization, then we must be comparing both of these civilizations to a standard beyond both of them. A real unchanging standard. We call that today international law. Although a lot of people seem to get international law wrong today. That's what we did when we convicted the Nazis at Nuremberg. When they said, hey man, we were just following orders. We're following our government. And we said, no, there's a standard beyond your government. A standard beyond our government. And that standard is God's nature. And you violated that standard. You had a moral duty to disobey immoral orders from your government because your government doesn't give rights. The government doesn't take away rights. The government is supposed to secure rights. And if a government tries to tell you to do something that is immoral, you ought not do it. We're getting there, friends, in this country, aren't we? We're getting there. So, you've got to have a moral standard. Secondly, you've got to have an authoritative person who transcends humans to communicate and enforce the rules. Let's say right after this we all go to lunch, and I know we all are, right? In fact, in fact, you're even thinking about it. How can I sneak out of the back quickly to get there before Joe does so I can get the table first, right? You're already thinking this, I know. Suppose we want to go to a Chinese restaurant, we all go there, and we sit down and after we have our meal, we open up our fortune cookie and it says, time to get out and seek new opportunities. You'd go, well, that's a nice sentiment, but you wouldn't feel compelled, you wouldn't feel obligated to get up right then and get out of the building and go find new opportunities, right? Because a fortune cookie's random. There's no moral authority behind a fortune cookie. If a fortune cookie tells you to get out of the building, you go, oh, pff, yeah, right. But if this guy comes in and says, get out of the building, you'd go, okay, this guy has moral authority. There's a reason he's telling me to get out of the building. I better get out of the building. Or worse yet, if this guy shows up and he says, get out, <laughs> you'd get out, right? He's got some authority behind him. This guy's a better example, all right? Get out of the building. You see, laws require a lawgiver, a person with authority. If there's a law out there that says, don't torture babies for fun, or a law out there that says, murder is wrong, or rape is wrong, there has to be a lawgiver. In fact, this is the argument for the existence of God. Every law has a lawgiver. There is an objective moral law. In other words, it's not just my opinion or your opinion. It's really in an object out there, God's nature, that murdering is wrong or torturing babies for fun is wrong. Therefore, 
There is an objective moral lawgiver, and that would be God himself. If there is no God, nothing is ultimately right, nothing is ultimately wrong, everything is a mere matter of opinion. I don't have enough faith to believe that murdering Jews or torturing babies for fun is just a matter of opinion. It's not a matter of opinion, it's really wrong. If that's the case, there must be something really right, and that's what we mean by God's nature. You see this? This is a rock. Wow, we're going real deep tonight, today, aren't we? <laughs> Do rocks say anything? Do rocks have any moral authority over you? Can a rock tell you what to do? No, rocks don't do anything. Well, you know what atheists think? They think you're just a bag of rocks. You're just a bunch of chemicals. And there's no supernatural realm. So all that exists are basically rocks. How do you get morality from a rock? You don't. Yet you know there are certain things that are right and certain things that are wrong. You know, as Jefferson said, that we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men were created equal and endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. You know this. That's why he said, self-evident. Why do you know it? Because it's written on your heart. Who wrote it? The creator. Not a, not a rock. The creator. By the way, why did Jefferson put life first? Because the right to life is the right to all other rights. If you don't have life, you don't have anything. It's the supreme right. Now, how about the purpose, the purpose of life? We know we have a moral standard, that's God's nature. He's the authoritative person. What's the purpose? What's the purpose of life that transcends human opinion? I never thought I'd agree with Richard Dawkins on much, but let me agree with him on this. Here's what he says. Basically, there is no morality or purpose in his worldview. Here's how he's put it, and he's put it eloquently. In a universe of blind physical forces and genetic replication, some people are going to get hurt and other people are going to get lucky, and you won't find any rhyme or reason to it, nor any justice. There is at the bottom no design, no purpose, no evil, and no good. Nothing but blind, blind, pitiless indifference. DNA neither knows nor cares. DNA just is, and we dance to its music. We dance to its music. We're just nothing but moist robots programmed by DNA. Of course, you could ask Richard the question, if DNA is a program, and it is, who programmed it? <laughs> Programs come from programmers. Software comes from software writers. Code comes from coders. Messages come from messengers. Where did this come from, Richard? You can't evolve a code. But he's right. There's no justice. There's no right or wrong. If atheism's true. If we're nothing but a sophisticated bag of rocks, then nothing's right or wrong. I mean, am I sinning when I do this? Did I... Hurt that rock? Can I hurt a rock? Does a rock have any rights? Now, if I had a baby up here and did this, you'd go, yo, what are you doing? It's just a bag of rocks, don't get all upset. No, it's not a bag of rocks. It's a human being endowed by his or her creator with certain inalienable rights. The right not to be dropped on its head in church is one of them. In fact, you know, we're left with only two choices if you think about it. These authors put it this way. We either got God or nihilism. We are either images of God or clever murderous monkeys fighting for control over the banana supply. There is no middle ground. That's it. Look, there either are objective moral rights or there are not. Sorry, you guys are the not objective moral right crowd. They, they either exist or they don't. If they exist, God must exist because he's the only map. He can provide the moral standard, the authoritative person, and the purpose to life. Rocks can't give you right and wrong. Rocks are rocks. So again, why is something right or wrong? Something is right if it corresponds with God's nature. Something is wrong if, if it doesn't. If there's no God, there's nothing right or wrong. 
Nothing right or wrong at all. And I hear atheists all the time talking about all sorts of rights. There is no right unless there's a map. Objective morality requires a map. We only have two choices, either a mind like God or matter like rocks. Again, is this rock going to tell me to be nice to people? To do right? Don't do wrong? No, rocks don't do that. In fact, let's put it real simply in Dr. Seuss style. Rules come from who's, not it's. Rules come from who's, not it's. Who's the who? God. Even Cindy Lou Who, who is no more than two, could know that. I mean, you know the moral law from your, when you're a little child, you know this. You ever notice? What's one of the first things that a kid will say? Mine. Or, that's not fair. Where are they getting that from? It's written on their hearts. They know basic right and wrong. They know it because it's been written on their hearts. And it's not just that they know it, it's that there really is a standard out there known as justice, as fairness. And if there isn't, there are no rights, which means these aren't really rights because these are only rights in our imagination. Because God knows that these things harm people. They deviate from his plan, from his purpose, from his nature. So they can't be rights. We can imagine they are rights. The Supreme Court can say they are rights, but they're really wrongs. And by the way, we've got to get much more serious about this one, ladies and gentlemen, because many of us won't maybe engage in that. But unfortunately, many Christians will just decide to break up a, man a marriage just because they're not happy. Well, that's not the goal of marriage, ladies and gentlemen. The goal of marriage is not to be happy. <laughs> In fact, it was Rodney Dangerfield who said, my wife and I were happy for 20 years. And then we met. <laughs> now, don't get me wrong. You can be, I am happy in marriage. I'm just saying, that's not your standard. In fact, I think it was Gary Thomas who wrote the book Sacred Marriage. The subtitle of the book is All You Need to Know. It says, what if God created marriage not for our happiness, but for our holiness? You ever think about that? Maybe having to sacrifice for somebody else makes you more like Jesus. Ooh, isn't, it, isn't that what he did? Yes. Maybe that's the real purpose, in addition to procreation. So, if atheists are want to say they're going to have rights, they have to steal them from God. Because I hear atheists out there saying they have a right to all those things. They have a right to abortion, same-sex marriage, no-fault divorce, whatever it is. But if there is no God, there's no right to anything. In fact, there's not only no right to same-sex marriage, abortion, and no-fault divorce, there's no right to natural marriage, life, or anything else. Everything is a matter of opinion if there is no God. So when there are atheists out there in the culture saying they got a right to this or right to that, you ought to ask them, where do rights come from? Where do they come from? They're going to have a hard time establishing a right without God. They have to steal from God in order to argue against him. Now, if you want to go a lot further on this, this is the new book that we've been talking about, and those other crimes are in there, Stealing from God, Why Atheists Need God to Make Their Case. Uh, Mark right here and Ron is in here somewhere, are going to be teaching a new class on I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist beginning in September, and you can sign up on the book table back there. They're going to go through this in a lot more detail, and on the book table is a seven-hour DVD set, 12 parts with two workbooks. So if you really want to get into this material, you can, and you should sign up for the class as well. If you want us to email you some of this material for free, PDFs of the PowerPoint, that kind of thing, go to crossexamine.org forward slash CP. This weekend here at Cottonwood Creek, we had the college prep class, the cross examine college prep. So that particular CP, that's what that stands for. Type in cross examine forward slash CP. And by the way, all the proceeds from the sale of the books and the DVDs will go to feed needy children. Mine, okay? Just so you know. I got three sons, so I need some help, all right? All right, and in fact, another thing I want you to download for free is the cross-examined app 
On this app, we have our one-hour radio program every week, which, by the way, I think is on 90.5. Is that right, Mark? 90.5 here in Dallas. But you don't need to listen to it on AFR. You can actually listen to it off the app. And we present evidence for Christianity. We cross-examine ideas against it. And also, on that app is a is a quick answer section. So let's suppose you're having lunch with somebody and they say something against Christianity and you're not quite sure how to answer it. You take out your iPhone, you go, or your Droid or your Windows phone, you go to the cross-examined app in the quick answer section. Chances are the objection they brought up, we have an answer to right in the app. So you don't have to have all this stuff memorized. You just have it right there and you go, look, I'm getting a text. Oh, what about this? All right. So get the cross-examined app. About 65,000 people, as I say, have downloaded it so they're finding it very valuable. And you want to do this because you don't want this happening to you or your young person. Get them evidence so when they get to college, they're not going to walk away. And many of them will walk away again because they run into people like Christopher Hitchens. And we haven't answered them. Let me wrap this up by just saying a couple of things here. Let me ask you a question about Christianity. When people outside of the church, maybe even some inside the church, think of Christianity, do you think they kind of think of it as just a bunch of moral rules? Do this, don't do that. I kind of think that's the way we tend to think about Christianity. Do this and don't do that. But it's not really about that. Although obviously there are moral precepts in Christianity. But the, the moral issue regarding to Christianity is that none of us have lived up to whatever morality we think is true. We've all fallen short of it. So in my second debate with Christopher Hitchens, he kept talking about all the evil religious people have done, and I agree with him. I said, yeah, you know, Christopher, you're right. There's been a lot of evil done by religious people. Of course, with your worldview, there's no way to judge what evil is. Why? Because... The only way you can make sense of evil is if there's a standard of good, and the only way a standard of good could exist, in an objective sense anyway, is if God exists. So you're kind of proving God exists by saying there's evil. Because evil doesn't disprove God. It may prove there's a devil out there, but it doesn't disprove God. So I said to him, but Christopher, your book, which says God is not great, how religion poisons everything, isn't really true. The title's wrong. Why? Because religion doesn't poison everything. Everything poisons religion. Look, I poison religion. I can't live up to the pure words of Christ. Of course, if I could, I wouldn't need a savior. I wouldn't need Christ if I could be perfect. So I said to him, I said, Christopher, look, I admit it, I'm a hypocrite. I can't live up to this book. But if I could, I wouldn't need a savior. And when people tell me I can't go to church because there's too many hypocrites down there, I always say, come on down, pal. I got, we got room for one more down here. We're all hypocrites. If we were perfect, we wouldn't need a savior. In fact, that's why Jesus had to come. He said that for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. A ransom. Now, many of us are thinking, what's this ransom business? I'm a pretty good person. I don't need anybody to pay God off to get me off the hook. I can make it to God on my own. Nobody needs to pay a ransom. You know why we think that? Because we have a relative moral standard in our mind. From the moral giant Mother Teresa down to the moral midget Hitler. And next to Hitler, we put criminals. We know they're not quite as bad as Hitler, but they're bad. And then next to criminals, we put all the immoral people we all know. You know, our immoral friends and relatives who aren't quite as good as we are because our picture's right here next to Mother Teresa. <laughs> and then if we believe in heaven and hell at all, we arbitrarily draw a line in the sand and we say, these are the bad people over here. They're going to hell and we're the good people. We're going to heaven. Now, why are we comparing ourselves to one another? Paul says in 2 Corinthians 10, by the way, that's not very wise. Why would you compare yourselves to one another? You're not judging one another this way. You shouldn't be comparing yourselves to one another. The moral line doesn't run between people. The real moral standard actually runs across the top, and that's God's very nature that God's nature is the true moral standard. He is the standard, and all of us have fallen short of that standard. Every one of us has, from Mother Teresa all the way on down to Hitler. And what Christ has come and done is he's lived the perfect life in our place and has paid the price for what we've done. None of us has li have, li have lived up to whatever morality we believe in. We've all fallen short of it, and we've certainly fallen short of God's morality. 
So Christ had to come to save us. In fact, the reason he came was to be punished in our place. His life was a gift to you. Have you received his gift? Have you received his gift? If you haven't, why wouldn't you? It's free. You say, well, look, you know, I don't want to change my life. You don't really have to change your life because the gift is free. Now, if you do come to Christ, he will want to change you. And you will want to change you too because you want to be more like him. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. But the gift is free. If you have received his gift, does anyone know it? Or are you an undercover Christian? If they were to drag you into a courtroom and try and convict you of being a Christian, would you be convicted or would you be acquitted? Well, there's not enough evidence here. Let this person go. If that's you, you may want to reconsider how you've been living because the least that we can do after what he's done for us is to stand for him, as imperfect as we are. In fact, Paul says that God makes his appeal through us. That God is making his appeal to other people through us, which means everything we do every day has an impact not only on time, but on eternity for good or bad. In one sense, that's exhilarating. In another sense, that's horrifying. That everything we do every day has an impact in time and eternity? Yeah. Why? Because there is a real purpose to life. What's the purpose? To know God and to make him known. That's why we're here. Not just intellectually to know him, but to know him personally and to help other people to know him. To be reconciled to him. And the only way you can be reconciled to him is through Christ. Because he's the only one, the only perfect being that could pay the price for the sins that we've all committed. Have you done that? Why wouldn't you do that? In fact, I was in the hotel last night. I turned the TV on. You know who was on? Billy Graham from 1992. I watched the whole thing. I don't know what it is with Billy Graham. It wasn't like he's Einstein up there, but whatever he said, I'm, going, I'm almost crying. I'm going, this guy is unbelievable. God is working through him. All he's saying is, look, come. Come as you are. That's why Christ came, because he loves you and wants to give you the life that you should have because he's paid the price for your sins. If you've never done that, you need to do that. Father, we thank you that you have come, that you've put your moral law right on our hearts, that we don't even need to look outside of ourselves to know it's there. The conscious, conscious that you've given us comes from you. We know you exist just from the fact that we understand there's a real right and wrong. And we know we've all violated that real standard of rightness. So I pray today if there's somebody here who's never accepted the free gift that you provide, that today they would. Why would you wait if you haven't? And for those of us that already have, I pray you'd give us a new boldness, a new way that we can reach people right through the moral law, right through right and wrong. Because everybody knows they haven't lived up to whatever standard that they think they believe in. How are they going to deal with that? The only way to deal with it is through Christ. Give us the boldness to say that. I pray your blessings on Cottonwood Creek Baptist and everyone here. Make us bold as we go out. In Christ's name, amen.